Today I'm going to show you how to make your own photo etched metal parts at home. There are many companies that you can pay to do this for you, but why do that when for a fraction of the cost, you can do it yourself. Professional etching houses use the same techniques that I'm going to show you here. Typically the size of metal ranges from a half a thousandth of an inch to 32 thousandths of an inch, and sometimes going up to an eighth of an inch. The thicker the material you use, the less precise your final part will be. In this demonstration I will be showing how to get your artwork ready. Making a stencil. Application of photo resist. Putting your design onto your resist. Developing the film. The process of etching. Removing the remaining resist. An environmental cleanup. Your artwork is the most important part of this process and so you will need to spend a lot of time on getting your artwork ready. Whether you draw it yourself and scan it into your computer or find your design online, you'll need to do some additional work to make it usable. Once you get your design onto your computer, you'll need to use a program like Microsoft Paint, Photoshop, or Corel Draw to clean up your edges. This is the circuit board that I designed in Word, then did a print screen and copied into Paint. Once zoomed into, you can see all of the error correcting that needs to be done. Black needs to be black and white needs to be white. There should be no gray. When I use the paint bucket to change colors, you can see what still needs to be changed. When we put the design onto our metal, we are going to use a negative image. So I'm going to change black to white, and white to black using red and green to help. It should be noted here that paint has a maximum of 96 dots per inch. If you are taking your work to an etching house, they will ask for at least 600 dots per inch. If you need that kind of resolution, Photoshop or Corel Draw is the way to go. This is a panel I scanned. The process is the same, but obviously, there's more work to do. Be aware that cleaning up the artwork is a very long procedure that can, and most likely will, take several hours to complete. There are three ways I will describe on how to design your artwork. The first is if you want to make a single-sided circuit board. The second is if you want to have holes completely through your metal. The third is if you want raised or lowered areas of your metal. And of course you can have combinations of the latter too. A single-sided circuit board is a laminate board with a thin layer of copper. Only a single piece of artwork will be needed and printed only once. The edges are determined by the laminate board and cannot be etched through. Only the metal will be etched away. A design that is fully etched through and is the same on both front and back will require one piece of artwork, but will be printed twice. The artwork will end up creating the outer and inner edges during the etching process. If you want raised or lowered edges on your metal, you will need to have two different pieces of artwork. The top piece in this example shows where the outer edges are, but also what will be partially etched creating a raised or lowered effect. The back piece of art only gives a border. If you do not have a border piece you may end up with two or more pieces when you've finished etching. Sometimes that's going to be okay, but sometimes you might end up with more than you bargained for. This is a combination of the last two options. The artwork is designed to have through holes as well as raised and lowered edges. Once you have your artwork done, you'll need to print your design onto transparency film. There are many kinds available through office supply stores or through eBay. Make sure the kind you buy is correct for your type of printer. If you're going to etch a circuit board, then you will only need one copy. Otherwise you will need to print out at least one copy of front and back, maybe more. Look closely at your page. You will probably notice some tiny areas that your printer missed. If that's the case, you're going to need to use a Sharpie and fill in those tiny spots. If you have a high quality printer that hasn't missed anything, consider yourself lucky. Now you have your artwork, and it's time to make a stencil out of it. I use Optics Plexiglass for my stencils. There are many brands out there, and not all are created equal. Your plexiglass needs to allow ultraviolet light through it. If the plexiglass you buy has UV protection, you will not be able to use it. Lexan is popular, but it will not work here. It does not allow UV light to pass through. When we transfer the design onto the film, it is done through UV light. I will be showing other ways to put an image onto your metal later, but this method requires UV light. If your design is for a circuit board, all that's needed is to tape a copy of your design onto a slightly bigger piece of plexiglass. With this design, I'm going to want to etch through from both sides. I've made a few copies of the design page, and cut them in half. With some tape, I secure the first one down and go through the other design pages to find one that matches exactly with the first. It's important to use the word exactly, 
as being slightly off will change how the finished design looks dramatically. Tape the top page to the bottom page on the same side when they line up correctly. Cut two pieces of plexiglass to the size and shape of your artwork. Place the artwork between both pieces of plexiglass and secure with a few clamps. Using a pliers and a butane torch, I heat up a brad nail and push it all the way through both pieces of plexiglass and the artwork, trying not to wiggle the nails I go through. A wiggle may create a distortion and distortions are bad. For this piece I used 5 nails. For this one I used 10 and have them on both sides. Your stencil is now complete. As long as you don't damage your stencil, it will be good for years and many thousand copies of your design. Photosensitive film is also called photoresist. The resist has three layers, a peel sheet, the resist and a cover sheet. For some reason, in the States it is ridiculously hard to find at reasonable prices. That is why eBay is our best friend. It is found mostly in China, although some suppliers are in Sweden or Poland, so it will take a few weeks to get from there to the States. When you get it, it will likely be wrapped in black plastic or something that will block light. It also has a distinct chemical smell that reminds me of a Walgreens photo mat from the 80s. Keep the resist in the black bag and out of any light until you plan to use it. Before we get into how to use it, it is very important to see how the manufacturers intended it to be used. While DuPont does not make their resist available for the common consumer, their data sheets are readily available online. This is negative working, which means that the black part of your artwork will be etched away, while the part that is clear will stay. Surface preparation for your metal is a mild alkaline cleaner. Simply put, Dawn takes grease out of your way. Laminating temperatures. Exposure rates in terms of Stouffer sensitivity guide. We will be using trial and error, but it's good to know about this guide. It gives you a visual guide to how much UV light your resist should be exposed to. This scale is not accurate, but it gives you the idea. If you'd like a guide, this is the place to get them. The chemicals that are used for developing are listed. Na2CO3 is sodium carbonate, also known as washing soda or soda ash. This is readily available in the states as soda ash in pool supply stores or super washing soda in Ace hardware stores. Etching is compatible with most acid etchants. I will be showing a hydrogen peroxide and muriatic acid etching solution. The stripping recommendations suggest sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. I will use a higher percentage of sodium carbonate. I will also show the effects of stripping with sodium hydroxide on brass. You will not likely get this information if you go through eBay, but luckily, there is little difference in technique between brands. It should be noted that there are different types of photoresist material available and not all of them are created equal. If you do a Google search on the term photoresist, you will very quickly run into sand carving photoresist under different proprietary names. Sand carving is an etching technique that is used to put images onto glass. It uses sandblasting as the method of etching the glass. The resist for sand carving is similar to what we will be using in that it is sensitive to light, but is not meant to be used for chemical photo etching. Please make sure you get the correct type of resist for your needs. Photoresist film is UV sensitive and has different reactions to different types of lighting. Instead of rambling on about different ways light reacts to the resist, I'll show you. This is fresh out of the package resist. This is after being exposed to incandescent lights for 6 hours. Fluorescent lights for an hour and for 3 and a half hours. Black light for 8 minutes. Direct sunlight for 1 minute. For our purposes I will be using a ballasted black light. There are many different types, but if it doesn't have a ballast, it isn't going to work. These are not black lights. They are nothing more than colored incandescent lights. I do not use CFL bulbs for any reason so I do not know how the resist will react to it. Now that you have some understanding of lights and lighting, it's time to figure out your exposure times and how to set up your exposure area. Your lamps should be 8 to 12 inches away from your exposure area. I use Baco portable work lights with the reflector removed. I use two of them because of the length of my stencils. You may only need one or may need more. Take a small piece of resist and put it in your stencil. Clamp it down. Put it under your exposure area and turn on the lights. Expose it for a minute. Turn off the light and see how well of a defined edge you have on your resist. This is an 8 minute exposure and it has clearly defined edges. It's what I use for this brand of resist. Now, on to the fun. Make sure you've cleaned your metal. 
First we're going to apply the resist to the metal. There are two ways I do this. For the first one you're going to need, the resist cut just bigger than the metal, scotch tape, water and spray bottle or bulbs or inch, scissors, and something like a plastic spreader. Take a piece of scotch tape and put it on the edge on one corner. Take another piece and do the same thing on the opposite side of the same corner. Make sure they run tight and pull apart. The clear plastic is trash. Apply water to the metal and to the resist side of the film. Put the resist side onto the metal and apply water to the cover sheet. Use your spreader and push the film onto the metal. Make sure there are no bubbles. Use a rag as needed to clean up excess water. Cut the excess resist from the edges and do the same thing to the other side. The second method is not as easy and not as accurate, but I'm going to show it in an attempt to be thorough. Remove the film and place the resist over your metal. Using your finger or something round, push the resist onto your metal. Your finger may produce enough heat to start adhering the resist to the metal. This can cause problems if bubbles form and you are unable to get them out. As long as the resist doesn't adhere to the metal, you may be able to readjust the film. If for some reason the resist doesn't adhere properly, you may need to go through the stripping process to remove the film and start over. It's better to spend a few pennies on a different piece of film than ruining your metal. Next we use heat to adhere the resist to the metal. There are two ways that I've used to make this happen. The first use is a laminator. This one has the top off, but it's not necessary to do that. I've had some pieces get stuck and I just find it easier to keep it off for when I need to pry out the next thing and clean it. I'm going to use a piece of white paper on top and bottom to act as a carrier pouch. You don't want to have the film directly touching the hot rollers. The infrared thermometer shows the output temperature to be around 155 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a little hotter than it should be, but it worked for this application. The second technique uses a portable heater, or even a hair dryer. The metal is passed in front of the heater until it has reached optimal temperature. Once it has, pressure is reapplied to the film to make sure it has properly adhered to the metal. This is used if you don't have a laminator, or if the piece of metal you plan to etch is larger than the laminator will allow. Once the metal has cooled down, it is put carefully into the stencil and clamped down. It's exposed for the amount of time done in the testing phase, for me it's 8 minutes. The lights are turned off and the pieces flipped over. It is again exposed for 8 minutes. Once again the lights are turned off. The clamps are removed, the stencil opened and the metal removed. Some data sheets require a 15 minute window between exposure and developing. Not all do, but it doesn't hurt to wait the 15 minutes before exposure and developing. Keep the resist away from any light to prevent overexposure. During that 15 minutes you can set up your developing tray. You are going to use super washing soda and water at a ratio of 1 to 115. For every gram of soda, you will use 115 grams of water. 3 grams soda to 345 grams of water. Make sure it's mixed well. Once you're ready to develop you're going to need to remove the cover sheet. Take a piece of tape and put it on one of the corners and peel back the cover sheet. Make sure you do it to both sides. Put your metal into the tray and rock the developer over your design for a minute or two, then turn it over and do the same thing on the other side. After two minutes on each side take your metal out and put it under a spray nozzle on your sink. If you don't have a spray nozzle, just put it under the faucet on high using cold water. You will need to do this a couple of times to get the non-exposed resist off your metal. You will be able to feel when the resist is gone. Your metal will feel slimy when there is still resist on the metal. You may need to use a soft sponge under the water to remove any unwanted resist. When developing is done, there will be a distinctive edge between the exposed resist and the metal. The data sheet says to blow dry thoroughly, hot air preferred. Keep in a dark place until you plan to etch. You now have your image on your metal. There is another way to get an image onto your metal. It's called the toner transfer method. This method also uses your artwork on transparency paper. Instead of using a resist film, Heat is used to transfer the image directly onto the metal. An iron is turned on and heats the transparency film along with the metal until the image goes from the paper onto the metal. This is useful in certain situations, but not for detail through hole etching. For the etching of our metal we're going to need a few things. Most important are rubber gloves and eye protection, and a plastic container. You will be working with acid, and safety is most important. Because we're going to be working with acid you're also going to need a very well ventilated area. Do not use any metal measuring cups or tools during this process. 
the only metal should be what you plan to etch. The most well-known etching solution is ferric chloride. However it's far more expensive than the alternative I will be showing. I will be etching with a 2 to 1 mixture of hydrogen peroxide and muriatic acid. If you're going to be using 3 cups of etchant, you'll use 2 cups of hydrogen peroxide and 1 cup of muriatic acid. In a plastic container, put your 2 parts hydrogen peroxide, then your 1 part muriatic acid. Then with gloved hands, place your metal to be etched. For demonstration purposes I use the whole sheet. Normally you would trim off excess around the edges or even cut this one sheet into three. You can see holes developing in the metal, then it coming apart. Unfortunately I decided to use a black container, so you cannot see the effects of the etching on the solution. The solution will turn from clear to deepening shades of green. As the color deepens, the strength of the etchant dilutes. This is the solution after the etching of these three were done. After you've completed the etching, thoroughly rinse off your metal in cold water. Do not dump out your etchant solution. I'll get to that shortly. To remove the remaining film from your metal, you're going to mix your water in washing soda at the rate of one cup hot water to one spoonful of soda. Mix, and when the crystals dissolve, put in your metal. Unlike during etching or developing, you will not agitate the solution. Just let it sit for a few minutes. You'll see the film separate from the metal. Flip the metal and let it soak on the other side. If there's a stubborn piece of film, just let it soak. Do not scrub or try to remove it manually, it can leave a stain on your metal. While I do not recommend stripping with sodium hydroxide, it does produce some interesting results that you might want to employ in your design. The data sheet mentions stripping with sodium hydroxide at a 1.5 to 3% ratio to water. This used to be available as Red Devil Lye. Now it can be found as Rudeo Lye Drain Opener. Not all drain openers are equal and only Rudeo is pure sodium hydroxide. It can be found in the states through Ace Hardware. When you mix it, only use cold water. This piece soaked in a 3% solution for one minute. You can see the reaction this sodium hydroxide has to the brass. This is the difference between stripping with sodium hydroxide and washing soda. Your pieces are now done, but you still have some work to do. The stripper and etching solution both need to be properly disposed of. The sodium carbonate and resist film solution should be filtered and the liquid can go down the drain. To filter I put some paper towels over the sink drain and pour the solution out. The resist film pieces can be thrown away. The etching solution is a little more difficult to dispose of properly. Different states and countries will have different regulations on how to properly dispose of this. I recommend you contact your local hazardous waste disposal center. Every city has one. Tell them you've been etching with hydrogen peroxide and muriatic acid. Also tell them what type of metal you've been etching, like brass or copper. They will tell you what steps to take. If for some reason they don't mention a few things, I will mention them here. First, do not ever put a tight lid on used etching solution that involves muriatic acid and hydrogen peroxide. A 2-liter bottle with used etching solution and a tight cap will quickly become an acid rocket. The solution gives off gas even after you take your metal out of the solution. That gas will pop your 2-liter bottle spraying acid everywhere while skidding across the ground. The waste disposal people might tell you that you can neutralize the acid with baking soda. If they tell you to do this, there is a reaction that you need to know about. When you put baking soda into your etchant solution, there is a violent reaction between the two. Make sure to do this in a well-ventilated area and in a container large enough to handle the reaction then dispose of as described by your local authorities. That's it. You're all done. Now go make something.